Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nadia al -Zabut. I'm R&D Senior Planner from Kuwait Oil Company, and uh, I'm the chair for the Women in Geoscience and Engineering Special Interest Community that has been established in November 2013 by EH. Uh, the purpose of the community is to facilitate communication between women and to, prom uh, to promote their active participation in EH-related activities. We thank you very much for attending, and we hope that you will enjoy our session today and will find it very rich. Our vision in the community is to be a worldwide reference group for women in geoscience and engineering. Our mission is to enable the exchange and mutual support among EH members, particularly women, for increased professional competitiveness and retention in the geoscience and engineering in, uh, community industry through promoting scientific knowledge, mentoring and guidance on career development. The values we hold in this community include equal professional opportunities for women and men, getting and sharing information, and promoting individual professional development in geoscience and engineering for women. Also, endeavor to apply high standards of integrity and ethics. The Women in Geoscience and Engineering community uses LinkedIn as a communication platform. At the moment, we have almost 400 members. 76% of them are from the oil and energy industry, 56% are from the research function, and 34% of them hold senior position. Through our LinkedIn group, we cover a wide range of topics for discussion, mentoring, motivation, and sharing announcement as well from EH board and committees. Initiatives such as Motivation Monday and Advice of the Month can inspire you and women all over to better succeed in their career, balance between your personal life and profession, or simply give you that little push by learning that you are not alone with your challenges or our challenges. During 2014 annual meeting in Amsterdam, EH and the community committee organized a special session for women in geoscience and engineering together. Ms. Roberto Camufo, Director Exploration North America and Brazil, Repsol, and Ms. Intisar al Kendi, Exploration Director, Petroleum Development, Oman, were invited to share their experience and their advice for success in the energy industry. The meeting was successful and included, included energetic and inspiring speeches. Today, we also offer a special session which features two inspiring speech, speakers providing a good mixture of career with personal life management and technical work, followed by interactive discussion, moderated by Ms. Gladys Gonzalez, Geophysics Development Manager, Upstream, Ripsol, and EH First Female President. And also we offer time to mingle with fellow participants. The first speaker, Ms. Suzanne, Robertson, uh, Rob, sorry, Ms. Suzanne Rosenberg, Director, Discipline, Career Management and Knowledge Management, Schlumberger, will talk about how to navigate successful career in the oil and gas industry. Our second speaker, Ms. Bettina Bachmann, VP Subsurface and Well Software Shell, Technical and Competitive IT, will be covering the topic of making choices and choosing opportunities in life, in particular, technical versus management. I welcome our speakers, Gladys Gonzalez, and all of you today to our session. Finally, all are encouraged to join, participate, and enrich themselves and others with a constant exchange of thoughts, experience, and support from the constantly growing female community within the energy industry. Please go to LinkedIn and search for the group EH Women in Geoscience and Engineering and send us a request now. Also, we encourage you all to participate in the survey that will be presented to you at the end of today's session. 
in order to give your opinion and also to show your interest to participate in the committee members for the community. So thank you very much and we start by Ms. Suzanne. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Susan Rosenbaum, and uh, thank you so much for inviting me to speak uh, and interact with you this afternoon. I'm really looking forward to a great discussion. Thank you. Uh, before I start my talk, however, um, I need to explain the way that I talk. I, I don't speak English, I speak Texan. And there's three key words in my vocabulary that I will use because otherwise I cannot speak. Uh, the first of these is y'all, that means everybody. Uh, the second is y'alls. I think it's the only word in the English language with two apostrophes. Uh, that's y'all possessive. So as you can see, y'all's communication plan is good, right? So it's possessive. Uh, and the third is all of y'all. And I realize that sounds a little redundant because y'all already means everybody. But when I get really excited, uh, I'll say all of y'all just to emphasize, I mean everybody, okay? So just translate as you go, and I hope some of you learn some new vocabulary and you'll confuse your colleagues uh, next week at work. So what, what I'm hoping for with, with the brief time we have together is, is that you get one takeaway from this talk. Uh, I'm going to tell you several things about my career or what I've learned during my career. Uh, as an engineer and scientist and, and manager. Um, but I'm hoping you take one of these at least away. And, and just think as we go through various steps of my career uh, about what change can you decide to make that will really impact your career as you have it. So let's get started. Uh, the first of my pieces of advice is to start every day with a clean coffee cup. It's really simple. Before you leave work, wash your cup, coffee, tea, whatever it is that you drink at work. It makes a huge difference when you come into the workplace the next morning and you're running late because something was happening at home or something with your kids and you have an 8 a.m. meeting or a 9 a.m. meeting or a 10 a.m. meeting whenever you start based on where you're based. Uh, but your coffee cup is clean and you can grab your coffee and you can get started. It's huge, it's huge. The feeling you get when you walk into your office and your coffee cup is dirty and gross based on everything that was left from the day before and you have to go deal with that first, starts you off on a bad foot, okay? So wash your coffee cup, it's easy. Second, Learn from the strengths of others. You're going to be working with a lot of different people over your careers. Many of you already have. Uh, and we all bring different skill sets to the table. So learn, you know, who's quiet and you need to talk with them, you know, individually, who's loud, and sometimes you might need to help calm them down so that others get their turn. But everybody gets a chance. The, the other thing that I, that I learned early on in Schlumberger, uh, probably two or three years after I started in the company, uh, was that you always need to be sure that you're nice to everyone because it's never clear either who's going to get put on your team and be working with you or who's going to become your manager or who you might be managing. So my anecdote in this uh, particular case, uh, again, I'd been with the company two or three years. Uh, there was one gentleman uh, in a different part of uh, the engineering team that uh, I had seen in action, let's say, and mentally I had decided I will never have him as a manager, ever, 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 right? He was obnoxious to people, loud, overbearing, you know, awful in meetings. I am never going to work for that individual. My next job was working for that individual. Now, luckily, I had always been 
polite to him. I mean, so that part was good, you know, I always kept quiet. And what I discovered was he was one of the best managers I ever had because he was one of those individuals who was fantastic for the people on his team. So if you reported to him, right, if you were part of his group, he was great, and he would protect you, and he would be nice, and you would have interesting technical discussions, and he was loud and obnoxious to everybody else that wasn't on the team. So it turned out to be a very good experience, and now we're, we're, we're good friends. You, you know, we don't have a uh, manager-subordinate uh, relationship. We haven't had that for years, but uh, we became good friends. So, you know, be nice to everyone, you never learn how it's going to work out, and, and use the strengths of everybody on your team. The next lesson that I learned is if you want a position, let people know that you want it, right? If you want a new position at your company. Now, I wouldn't suggest doing that three or four weeks after you've just got a new job, you go into your manager, oh, by the way, you know, I can't wait for my next job and this is what I want. You know, I would give it a year or two, something appropriate. Uh, but when you see something in your company that you want, you let people know that you want it. They can't read your minds. Okay, so my examples on this one. Um, uh, I have two kids, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as, as we go, but uh, uh, there was a position that I really, really wanted, and I started mentioning that to my manager or to my human resources person or to anybody that would listen in an appropriate way. You know, whenever things change and he's going to move to something else, I want that job, I'd like that job. Okay, then I was married, I got pregnant, I'm six months pregnant, and my manager calls me in and he says, congratulations, you've got the job you wanted. And I kind of looked down at my stomach, which was very, very clear at this point, you know, that I was pregnant, there was no surprise here. And I said, um, this is kind of an odd time to be giving me that job that I wanted. And he said, I know, but this way we know you'll come back. And I went, ooh. <laughs> And they were, it was right, because <laughs> I did. And so I thought, okay, that's clever. Um, uh, the <laughs> uh, so do ask for what you what you want. The current position I've got now in Schlumberger, um, I had a very good job that I was extremely happy with, but there was another job that I wanted. And so I started asking for this one. Um, I got it about a year ago. And when that was given to me, the, the gentleman that I replaced uh, retired from the company. I said, this is great. Um, who's going to take what I was doing before? And the senior manager who told me about the new opportunity just smiled. And I said, don't you tell me that I'm just adding on to what I was doing. And he smiles. And he goes, yeah, but Susan, we know you can do that. <laughs> I'm like, Ah, okay, and yeah, okay, fine, so I do it, it's great. Now, the other thing that I learned is it's also okay to make sure that a job that's being offered to you um, isn't necessarily something you have to take. And some of you may have been in the position in your companies where they said, we've got a great new opportunity for you. And that happened to me, you know, a couple of, several times, I guess, at, in, in Schlumberger, but one time in particular, uh, the human resources manager in, in my part of the uh, organization came and she said, we've got this great job to offer you, blah, blah, blah. And I said, okay, let me ask you a question. Are we having a Susan, would you like to take this job conversation? Or are we having a Susan, this is your next job conversation. And she said, we're having a Susan, do you want this job conversation? And I said, no, <laughs> I don't want that job. No, I don't want to do that. No, 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 I'm, no, thank you. And so ask it politely, right? But it is worth asking because sometimes the, you know, the company may be telling you, this is your next job. And you go, thank you very much, great even if you don't really think that. Uh, but sometimes maybe you do have a choice, right? So you want to feel that out. Lesson four, don't quit because of your manager. I I'm sure that some of you had had managers that were not your favorite person, right? Male or female. Um, luckily, they always 
change, right? Because the company will reorganize, they'll move on to something else. And, and, and what I've learned, because I've certainly had some managers that were not my favorite managers in the world, um, they eventually moved on to something else and I got to work with someone that I uh, enjoyed working with uh, much better. So just wait it out. You never want to quit your company because of your boss, period. Don't ever do that, right? Work with him or her to the best way possible, figure out what makes them tick, you know, maybe they're under some kind of uh, special stress themselves and you need to give them benefit of the doubt and just, uh, you know, try to understand where they're coming from, but things will get better and it will change. And so never quit because of your boss, right? Never. Lesson five, pick up the telephone. I, I am an email queen. I love sending email, love it. Oh, I should send her this, I should send him that. And I'm always sending, sending email. But it's far better, I mean, obviously face-to-face -face is the best, but you, you know, if, if you work in a company uh, like many of us do where people are located in many different locations, okay, you, you know, so you can't see them every day and you can send them email easily. but. Pick up the phone and have a conversation as much as you can because it just opens the communication channel much, much more than an email. I sound like I'm yelling in every email that I send, and I don't mean to. I don't mean to, but I know I'm, I'm a very direct person and I'm sending an email. Uh, I think it's a good idea to do blah, 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 blah. And I'm sure the person receiving the email is going, oh my gosh, there she's going again. She's yelling at me, telling me to do something. And I'm just trying to have a conversation, but you can't tell that from the email. Now, the other thing that you want to do, though, if you're picking up the telephone and talking, is to pay attention. Uh, since I love email, I also love to multitask. And so I'll call somebody, and I'll turn the speakerphone on, and I'm chatting away while I'm sending emails, right? And I'm chatting, listening, listening. And, and one of my uh, 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 best friends at work and a good uh, colleague catches me out on this all the time because we'll be talking, you know, and she'll go, I hear clicking sounds, you're typing again, you're sending emails, you're not listening to me. No, 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 I'm listening. Tell me you're not sending an email right now. Okay, fine, I'll stop, I'll stop. So pay attention, right? If, you, if you're calling somebody on the phone, give them your time for attention, right? And that's critical to make the connection and get the decisions made. Okay, dress appropriately. We all know this, we all look quite nice today, I would say. Um, but what have I learned? You, you know, you don't want to dress down too much at work just because other colleagues might dress down and be more casual. You want to present yourself very professionally. Now, you can take this too far. And when did I learn this? So my first job, before I, long before I joined Schlumberger, was with Texas Instruments. Uh, and it was my first job. I was single, no kids, and I was finally making money. Right, so a wonderful combination of things. And I do enjoy shopping, I will admit that, and I, I realize this is getting taped, so everybody will know that I enjoy shopping. And what I would do, because suddenly I was getting a paycheck where I'd never had a paycheck before, right? Um, I'd go shopping on the weekends, and I would come to work just about every Monday with something new on, because I just, I didn't go expensive, but I love shopping, and I would have some cute, you know, outfit, you know, I'd come into work until, one of my male colleagues one day said, do you realize we just can't wait to see how you're gonna dress every Monday? And I suddenly realized, I mean, you know, I was a computer scientist, I was doing computer science, I was programming, right? And, and I, they, I wasn't being taken as a professional, I was being taken as somebody who goes shopping and wears something different to work every Monday. And that wasn't the impression that I wanted to give, and that wasn't how I wanted them to think of me. So I stopped, right? So, yeah, I mean, it's not like I stopped shopping, right? But, uh, you know, I balanced it and tried to make mental notes of when I was doing something different and new or overdressing, perhaps, for the situation because they weren't taking me professionally at work, right? And that was a big no-no. Leave work when you need to leave work. So these are my kids. Uh, you can see they're, they're not young anymore. I don't, I don't know who the guy is in the back with the beard. He's not my kid. I, I don't know who that person is, but 
this is my son and my daughter. Um, and so what, what did I learn with them? Uh, so when my son was born, I was managing a small team by then in, in Schlumberger, 10 to 12 people, uh, and, and we had a nanny at home. My, my husband works also at, at, at Schlumberger, so uh, we had a nanny that came to the house, and she left at 6 p.m., right? She left at 6 p.m. And so at 5.30 every day, right, I would say, whoop, nanny's going to leave. I've got to go. I'll see y'all tomorrow. Now, if I needed to keep working, I would take my computer home with me, I'm sure just like many of you do, right? And I continued working at night after, after my son was uh, asleep. But I left at 5.30, and my team knew I left at 5.30, so don't schedule meetings for me at 6, because I leave at 5.30 because the nanny left. And, and the team got to where they'd say, well, Susan, 5.20, nanny's about to go, you'd better leave. I'd go, well, yes, you're right, thank you, I'm out of here, right? And they would tell me to, to go out the door. Uh, by the time I was pregnant with my daughter, I, I was managing a large department, so I was managing managers, right? So it was about 100 people in total, right? So I was managing managers. Uh, and when I was pregnant with my daughter, I was put on bed rest, right? So I could not physically go into work because she was re ready to arrive way too early, all right? So some of you may have gone through this, but when you're on bed rest, you're kind of like Cleopatra lying on your side with your computer, of course, I mean, I had my computer uh, working, but you couldn't get up and go into work, right? Not allowed. Well, I always had with my uh, managers that reported to me, I, I had weekly meetings every Friday, and, and I lived close to work, uh, and so I basically didn't see any reason that those Friday meetings couldn't continue to happen. And, and so I got my administrative assistant to order pizza, uh, and so pizza would magically come to the front door. Uh, my husband would leave for work, leave the front door unlocked. Um, whoever got to my house first of my team would pick up the pizza boxes and bring them inside. I'm Cleopatra on the couch, and I'm holding my staff meetings, right? So what's happening in manufacturing now? Yeah, but what are we hearing from the field? I don't know why that's not working. How's the software going? And we just kept going. Yeah, right? And so I had those un until I, I gave birth to her. Uh, when I went back to work uh, after taking uh, maternity leave, uh, one of the, the men that reported to me came up and told me those were the worst staff meetings he's ever been on in his life. And I said, why? I thought I did a pretty good job. I thought we covered the topics. You know, I thought it was went fine. He goes, you don't understand. We were afraid every Friday that you would go into labor in the staff meeting. And I said, I was not going to do that. You know me better than that. And he goes, yeah, okay, right, fine. So uh, uh, you, make it, you make it happen, right? So, you know, I never hid the fact that I was having kids because that was pretty obvious. Um, but I did what I need to do to be successful at work um, with, with the kids once they started showing up, right? And, and, you, and you work it out. Lesson eight, coordinate schedules with your partner. So when, like I said, my husband works as well, uh, and when, and we both travel for work. I've always traveled for work for Schlumberger. Um, and, and so we have to coordinate schedules. And so when my, our, our son was born, and we continued this uh, with our daughter, um, we would have to make sure that our schedules co were coordinated because the rule was that we always kept that one of us was always home. We never traveled out of town at the same time. I just wasn't comfortable doing that, right, we, with two kids at home, particularly two younger kids at home. So whoever, right, there, so the rule that I came up with was whoever grabs the dates first wins. Now, why did I think that was a good idea? I am a very organized person, and I know when I'm traveling between now and just about the end of the year. You know, I've got trips planned, I know, they're on the calendar. My husband is not so organized, and so luckily that means that usually I grab the times I need first, and I'm very happy, and he, we share an Outlook calendar so he knows, you know, when I'm not there, and he schedules meetings around me because the rule is whoever grabs it first wins. Now, I'm being a little facetious. Uh, you know, if a really critical meeting came up for him, obviously I would change things around, right? But you do have to coordinate the schedules, 
right? Whether it be with your partner, spouse, maybe you don't have kids, maybe you've got dogs and you have to feed your dogs. I mean, there are things that happen that you and your partner need to coordinate. So do it however works best for you. Lesson nine, uh, pay for help when you need it and don't feel too guilty about it. So when I first started working and when I had kids, I was gonna do it all. I mean, I know how to clean house, right? I know how to do that. I know how to wash clothes. I know how to cook, even though I hate cooking, but I mean, I do know how to do it. And so I'm doing, 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 doing. And sometimes it gets to be a bit much. And I suddenly realized, you know, I'm making money and my husband's making money, and we could pay people to do some of the things that we are struggling to try to do to juggle our home life and our work, work life. And so one of the things that we started doing was pay for somebody to come clean the house. Now, do I sometimes feel guilty about that? Yeah, a little, because again, I know how to do this. But when I come home on Friday and the house is clean, it's like, a miracle has occurred. You, you know, it's just wonderful. And it's okay because, you, you know, she's happy, I'm happy, my husband's happy, and we have a clean house. So pay for what you need to do to get things done. Besides kids, we have two dogs. I love my dogs. And I feel guilty about leaving the house between 7 and 7.30 a.m. and getting home around 6 or 6.30 p.m. I feel guilty with my poor two dogs. So we write checks for that too. So we have a pet nanny now that comes and she walks the dogs at 10 and she walks the dogs at 2. And the dogs are very content and happy and I write checks, right? And I don't feel guilty. So you have to pick which battles you want to spend money on, but trust me, you can get everything that you need handled so that you don't feel guilty about whatever's happening at home. Lesson 10. Take a seat at the table. Y'all did really well taking a seat at the table here, so this was good. But, but here's my observation, and I'm sure some of you have either watched Sheryl Sandberg's Lean In video uh, TED Talk or, or read her book, the fantastic book. Do it if you read it if you haven't read it. Uh, but, but one of the key lessons that she relates that I talk about, particularly when I'm meeting with other women, is if you walk into a conference room and there's a big table, and it's going to be a big meeting. And there are chairs at the table, obviously. And there are also chairs around the outside of the room. Sometimes I've seen that we, as women, have a tendency to take one of the chairs around the outside of the room. I don't want any of y'all to do that again. I'm serious. Don't do it. You take a seat at the table because you were invited to this meeting just like everyone else. You're not trying to push somebody out of a chair, obviously. I mean, it needs to be an empty chair. Um, but, but you have a right to a chair at the table just like everyone else. And so don't put yourself down by, unless the table is completely filled, by not taking a seat at the table, okay? Don't sit around the outside, right? If you're there first, you grab a seat. So let me, let me wrap up. So you define success for yourself, right? You can have a very successful career. You can juggle work and home and career. You will drop some balls. You know, did I miss some key soccer or football games of my kids? Yes, I did. Was I out of town sometimes for parent-teacher conferences and I had to trust my husband to tell me, well, what did she say? You know, what, what was he doing? Okay, you know, so, okay, but that's the way it is, right? You, you can't do everything, but you make the choice on, on which balls will get dropped, and, and you just move on, because you'll have a very happy life with a clean coffee cup, with a very good, happy, clean house, with clean and settled and happy children or dogs or pets, uh, you, you know, with a partner who is happy to see you when you come home, and you have made yourself the opportunity to have a very, very successful career, which is what we all want. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Susan. Uh, 
I felt that you are talking about me in most of the points that you were discussing. So I believe we, we all share some, some of the um, experience that you had, especially with life and balancing it with work. So thank you very much for that. Um, so I welcome Ms. Bettina for her speech. Thank you, Nadia, and uh, thanks, Susan, for an inspiring talk. It uh, is a hard act to follow. So, also a, a warm welcome from me, and I'm delighted to be here, to be part of this network, and uh, look forward to speaking to you and to sharing a few of our experiences. I hope the sound is okay when I stand here. I, I notice there is sometimes a bit of an echo. So indeed, my talk is uh, the topic of making choices and choosing opportunities, but also particularly about uh, looking at more managerial versus more technical roles in life. This topic is close to my heart, not because I have a lot of advice to give or, or recipes or, or a book to write about, more because I've been wrestling with it for many years myself especially the early years of my career. And that's over 30 years as a geoscientist in the oil industry. So the way I'm trying to approach this is uh, indeed in kind of uh, three sections. The first one is a bit more general on diversity, because I do think the topic as such is nothing specific to women. It applies just as well to men. But because of the diversity issues that we still have in our industry, it is kind of experienced much more strongly by women. The second part is more or less looking at life choices and uh, sharing a few anecdotes. And uh, forgive me if I do that. I, I know 31 years indeed uh, give us a lot of experience and a lot of anecdotes to tell. Many of you are much younger than I am here in the room and uh, I think that's great. But so stop me if you get bored with my anecdotes. The third part will be a bit more practical, indeed, looking at the technical versus managerial, having a few philosophical, but also some more, indeed, uh, practical remarks about it. So, as I said, diversity is a big topic for us, not just in our industry, but in society in general. But like many global corporations, the data from Shell shows that we are totally committed to a diverse workforce. And the reason for showing that is just to make you aware that we can learn a lot from the way other diverse groups manage their issues. I do think networks like this one can benefit from other networks. I do think as women, we have probably been a bit late in the game in forming these networks, sharing with each other and supporting each other. So it's important for ourselves, also for our own approach to it, that we realize that while still the most visible part of diversity, if you look at the famous iceberg diagram that I'm sure you're all familiar with, gender diversity is still the most obvious one. It's the one that jumps at us and that people notice, even if you see a person from a very long distance away, it's probably the first assessment, the first decision you make, which is, is that person male or female? So that in itself has, of course, triggered many, many issues over the years. And it has also led to target setting. It has led to many, many efforts to change it. When actually, if you ask me, the most important to change it is inclusiveness. It's actually to drive the focus away from diversity and look at being inclusive. And that's something that each of us can start with ourselves, with our own lives. The biases we have, be it cultural, be it, uh, be it professional, be it gender, be it whatever, the way we were brought up, they're very strong in our life. And we do tend to make decisions, we do tend to, to make judgments about others in a way that is actually totally unnecessary. And it is these kind of judgments, these kind of perceptions that, uh, that are not just made at individual levels, 
but at team levels, at company levels, at nation levels, and they cause a lot of problems in, uh, in, in due course, as we all know. So the more inclusive we are, I'm convinced, the less issues we will have diversity with diversity. Because we can then embrace it. We can then really say that diversity is a good thing. Every, each and every one in, of us in this room is diverse, is unique as a human being. And we can, to some extent, celebrate that and, and bring that to fruition. But inclusiveness is a, is a soft issue, is a soft topic, as we know. And we struggle with those, especially in male-dominated industries. Diversity is easier to manage because you can set targets. And to set targets, we need a business case. We're good at that. We need business cases for everything, and we are experienced at building them. And it is one message that I want to put out there very clearly. The business case for why women mean business also in our industry is there. Don't ever let anybody question that. It has proved, been proven time and time again that especially global corporations that are both ethnically and gender diverse bring better profits. It's as simple as that. I won't go into all the rest of the details. You will know them, you will have heard of them, and it's important, I think, that we just stand our ground on this. This is not something that we have to defend as individuals and explain and gather data. It is one of the things that I have often heard when indeed senior management wasn't happy with a proposal. They will, they will tell you, isn't it a great idea? And why don't we gather some data? The data for that why women mean business is there and has been presented many times. So having said that, I think we've made a lot of progress over the past few years. And the data, again, shows it. This is shell data, but it's pretty standard all across the industry. We are making steady progress, and we certainly have made huge advances when it comes to sorting out the practical challenges of daily life. As you can see on this list, most things are pretty much in hand. And while not all our younger women always know what they are entitled to get and what is actually in place, it is important that you ask for it, that you are inquiring about it. But what I also want to point out with these kind of arrangements, it is in a, in a typical way, it's the practical side that has been addressed and sorted with, with rule books and with arrangements, etc. And most of them, as you can't uh, fail to notice, are related to motherhood. Now, I'm a mother myself, I have two kids, but when I look back at 31 years of geoscientist's career, well, there were a few years when I felt very motherly, which was indeed when the kids were born and when I was breastfeeding them and when I was really juggling some very specific things. But the rest of the time, I was quite simply a female geophysicist with a big interest in the energy and especially the oil and gas industry. I was also a wife. I was a daughter. I'm a mother to kids. I'm a working partner. All these things, they matter. But there are working parents out there that are men as well. They struggle with exactly the same things that I do. And it's important to keep that kind of imbalance we shouldn't let the whole diversity, the whole gender diversity issue slip into one where childcare needs to be sorted. That's a practical, simple aspect. We have a right that this is sorted out, just like men have a right that this is sorted out somehow or other. It's a society issue, and it's not something that women individually should be pushed into solving. So let me change tack here a little bit and indeed move on to these famous life choices. As I said, I do think as women we struggle more intensely with them, partly because we do feel our biological clock ticking at some stage, partly we do feel very vulnerable and very judged in our various roles in the world, depending on where we come from and how we were brought up. 
So we struggle with all this, and, and I'm no exception to this. And interestingly enough, for me, it started on that day that I decided to study earth sciences in Switzerland. I was going to go to the ETH in Zurich, which is a, a well-known university for engineers. And um, well, my dad, my brother, most of the men in our families, both my mother's and my dad's side, had been to this university. But certainly no, none of the females had ever gone there. And my dad, who had always supported whatever I did, and I, never, I was never brought up in the sense of, yeah, you should do this or that with your life. He's kind of sat me down outside on the terrace, and uh, he just said, do you really think this is a good idea? And I said, why? And he said, well, I mean, I just envisage that if one day you will be wanting a family and combining a career in such a profession with a family will be very difficult, if not impossible. So you will be forced to make choices and to set priorities. Well, yeah, I was 18 at the time, and um, while I, uh, I appreciated the fact that my dad gave me this advice because he would not often do that, I, I decided to go along with whatever I wanted. So I did study, and, um, and I enjoyed it thoroughly, and then moved on indeed, went for job interviews. And that was an interesting experience when I compared that with how the interviews in those days in Shell went for whether you were male or female. As a, as a Swiss person, you had to go to The Hague for two days, and you had two days of, of non-stop interview schedules with lunches, dinners, everything included. And um, indeed, I was out of the probably dozen interviews that took place. Many of them were technical. They almost felt like an extension of my master's exams. So I had to really prove that I knew what it meant to migrate seismic data and stuff like this. Just to be told in the end, we sort of um, shrugging their shoulders, well, you know, we are employing people, we are employing geoscientists into exploration such that they can be exploration managers after 20 years, such that they can run a venture in a difficult country. And you will probably want to get married and have kids one day. Okay, I mean, what, what can you say to that? Yeah, there is, there is no answer, really. And, uh, and the clue to it was, uh, was the one, the last interview where, um, where this particular leader sort of looked at me and said, and are you able to fix a diesel engine in the desert? And then I said, no, I think you need a mechanic for that. And, and I, was, I was really annoyed. I walked away from two days of interviews thinking, well, not only will they never offer me a job, but I also don't want this. I mean, they're talking about a world of yesterday, and I can envisage a world where the majority of the work will anyway take place in an office, and we'll handle it as we get there. So this is, I think, an important point I want to make envisaging the world and imagining it, how it will be, and what strengths and what skills will be needed, I think is key for all of us when we try to shape our future. So all this kind of conditioned me to think I, lead, I, I need a life plan, I need a roadmap, I need priorities, and I need to know what I do when the moment comes. Now the interesting is, thing is, these choice points they often come at a time when you're not prepared, and you have no time to think even, you, you just react to it. Or you do something, you set something in motion, that only much, much later you realize, okay, that was the trigger to what happened to me and what I achieved for the following 10 years. So with that, I probably want to say, take it easy, relax, and just do your best every day. But for me, there were some of these really interesting moments indeed. My, my first job was, uh, was in Tunisia, in Tunis. And um, I was working there, and I knew I was planned to go to PDO, to Oman, after that. But the visa hadn't arrived for various reasons. And nobody knew when and how this would happen. I had a boyfriend who was based in The Hague at the time. And it kind of, we figured out that that worked quite well with me in Tunisia, he in The Hague, and, and we saw each other every month. We kind of worked that out. It was quite okay. 
And then one day the exploration manager came and he said, I need to talk to you. And uh, he showed me the telex and he said, you can go to Oman now. And those were the days before Facebook and mobile telephones and where you had choices. It was really like the pink telex arrived and there was a one liner and you put your shoes on and went, wherever that was. That was, that was part of the deal. So in this case, he called me in and he said, so you can go to Oman now. And I was kind of shell, I was kind of shocked. I hadn't expected it. I wasn't prepared for it. And then what shocked me even more was when he said, but I wouldn't mind keeping you here if you would prefer to stay here. Of course, he had gotten to know me. He knew about my relationship and all that. And he knew that going to Oman meant that we wouldn't see each other for six months. Well, the deal was for bachelors at the time you work for six months, then you get a month's leave, and then you do your next six months. And that was the structure of the job. And, and then I said, can I think about it? And he said, no, I'm not supposed to give you the option anyway, so you have to decide before you leave this room. So indeed, what life plan, what principles, what priorities can you apply in such a moment? All I knew was, I was really that keen to go to Oman. Everybody had said, this is the best place to learn the job. Exploration is fantastic. You drill a lot of wells. So I said, okay, I'll go. But it was tough, yeah? It was, it was not something that easily worked out. And, uh, and indeed, it was something that required a lot of effort, a lot of commitment from both of us. Many years later, Indeed, I was married to that very boyfriend, so the relationship survived. <laughs> and I still am married to him, by the way. <laughs> and, um, and our first child was born. We were uh, by then our son, so we were by then in, in, in the NAM, in the northern part of Holland. And I was going to go back to work, and I was very keen to work part-time. I wanted to work four days a week. I had sorted it all out with HR. Nobody seemed to have a problem with it. I was going to start on Monday, my childcare was set up, everything. I was a bit nervous, but never mind, like every young mother who goes back to work the first day is, especially when it's a new country and a new job and, and the team that you don't know. So 11 o'clock Friday morning, the phone rings and HR tells me that the deal is off because the exploration manager insisted that he wouldn't give this plump job to somebody who only wanted to do 80%. So it's either 100 or nothing. And then they also they wanted me to decide by the end of Friday, which I then said, well, I'll, you will either see whether I'm there on Monday or not. So I had the, I had the guts to say that and gave myself time to think, think in circles indeed, around all these circles that I just uh, outlined. At the end of the day, I talked to my mother and that was yeah, indeed, that was a pivotal advice that she gave me then. My mother has no understanding of, of what I'm doing in this industry. She just knows me. And she just said, you see, if you're 80 one day and you think back of this day and you haven't given it a try, you will regret it. And it only took that, and I think it's, it's, it's a, an advice that I've kept for myself. If I'm really not sure, give it a try. Nothing is ever totally final, yeah? You can always step out again. And children are more resilient than we think, and so are we. we. So there were many moments like this um, in, in my life and in my career. I uh, probably won't dwell on too many more. The last one that I may want to quote is, is my own daughter, who was this, this little stocky girl when she was about three or four. And um, there was this moment, we were in Damascus at the time, and all the other moms would go in and do cooking and reading classes with, uh, with the kids at school. And of course, I never, I never went, yeah? I was never there. And, uh, and then one day she sort of, she stood in front of me and she looked at me and she said, why can't you be a normal mummy? <laughs> and that, 
yeah, that, that hurts for a moment, yeah, yeah, yeah. She forgot about it and they never knew anything different and, and, and I think they still had a very good childhood. But it, this moment came back to me and I reminded her of it. She doesn't remember it, of course, she's 21 now. But probably about five or six years ago when I for the first time applied internally in Shell for a really more senior management position, I wasn't really sure whether I would qualify for it, whether I could get it, and I had all these self-doubts. And she looked at me and she said, what on earth are you talking about? You can do all these things. Step up and go for it. And I, I thought that was quite interesting, yeah? So how sometimes it is our own children that we feel guilty about and we feel we have deprived them of certain things. They are the one that believe in us most and, and are actually quite proud of what we achieve. So yeah, let, let's move on to the last section on the technical versus, um, versus management side. I think we have a lot of perceptions about this, especially as, as women. Indeed, the technical side is what we know best. We invest a lot of time in it, we grow, we develop mastery at it, we are, we are confident about it. And it, it is our whole identity that we see in it. We love to work in teams. It kind of feels good. It's collaborative. It's creative. And we just work best when we have the flexibility of these technical roles as well. At the same time, management or leadership, yeah, corporate roles, corporate agendas. Can I still get out in time to run to the crash? That type of question. Unknown challenges, yeah, like the, the, indeed the, the outfit that we've just heard. It is competitive and it can be lonely. So I think it is around these perceptions that we often feel, I need to make a decision. These are different worlds. And just a little bit to take, uh, to demystify that there are different worlds, I, I picked out our current career path framework for exploration. And without going into too much detail, I think what you see here is very clearly that while you start in a deep technical career, at some stage you do grow, you do take certain leadership and certain managerial roles in this context, but they are not non-technical. In the contrary, you will find the word exploration or technical or geolo geology or geophysical all the way up to the top. People in upstream, in the upstream industry, are employed and paid and valued for the fact that they have technical depths. So it will never go completely away. And you can leverage in various ways. So I think with that, indeed, coming maybe to the end of the talk, if you think of your own future, it is important that you imagine it that you envisage this world of tomorrow that will matter to you, just like it was very, very clear to me at the age of 24 when I was asked whether I could fix a diesel engine in the desert, that that was not going to be the world of tomorrow. The world of tomorrow will not be one of managerial or technical or whatever. It will be more than ever a world where a deep technical understanding of the subsurface is essential to solve the energy problems and challenges that we have, whether they are now on the alternative side or whether they are in the more conventional gas and oil businesses. So the understanding that you bring, the technical knowledge that you bring to the table will be essential, and especially your ability to translate uncertainties and risks to a society that struggles with this that wants 100% guarantees. All of you here in this room are people who know the difference between that, who can manage that, who can handle that. And as women have a, usually, or many of us have a, a pretty good gift in translating this and indeed in changing this industry and uh, solving the energy problems of the, of the future. So with that, I think indeed the, the future is bright for people with, uh, with our profession. There are many things to do, probably very few decisions to make up front, but to stay on our toes and uh, make sure we make the best of the opportunities that come. <laughs>